Okay, I think that is all of the housekeeping out of the way. So it's my great pleasure. My, by the way, I'm Joel Rasmus. I'm managing director of Sirius. Uh, and it's my great pleasure to introduce my, my boss, uh, Dong Young Ju, who will kick off this event. Dong Young. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joel. Uh, and uh, my name is Dong Yan, and I'm the director of Sirius. And on behalf of all the organizers here, I would like to uh, open two exciting events at the same time. The second annual Indiana Statewide Academic Cybersecurity Alliance Summit and the 24th annual Sirius Cybersecurity Symposium. So I would like to extend a very warm welcome and welcome back to all of you from academia, industry, and government. And thank you for being here at Purdue University for our shared interest and passion in cybersecurity. So we have an exciting two-day program waiting for you with keynotes, uh, panels, fireside chat, uh, tech talk, an in-person poster session, and a birthday party celebration tonight, as Joe mentioned. The party is to celebrate the 25th anniversary of Sirius. Time really flies. Uh, we would like to thank our honorable keynote speakers, panelists, uh, tech talk and poster presenters and representatives of, from our strategic partners to the symposium for your time and for your contribution. We admire your technical vision, uh, achievements and experiences in cybersecurity that you are gonna share with us. Uh, I would also like to express my special thanks to our colleagues from Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory who worked hard to uh, bring the, uh, the pre-symposium Cyberfire Pass the Flag training session to our students this past weekend. Uh, so the term cybersecurity has a uh, ever expanding scope today. It covers not only the traditional cyber systems and infrastructure, such as our clouds, our computers, and smartphones. It is now also expanding to any real world physical systems or infrastructure that has a cyber or digital component. Uh, moreover, we have recently witnessed the significant advances in artificial intelligence and its application to cyber physical systems, services, and infrastructure. While I can uh, simply certify that this opening remarks are not generated by chat GPT, uh, you know, who knows, who knows if a chatbot will be speaking in my place next year, right? So consequently, the cybersecurity R&D education workforce development has never been so interdisciplinary and full of new challenges and opportunities. So we at Sirius envision the uh, embedding, if you will, of cybersecurity in a wide range of art, science, and engineering disciplines. We call our vision Cyber Plus X. So X is equal to AI, avionics, energy, transportation, space, sports, you name it. So this vision is being reflected by our ongoing R&D and education initiatives and by the topics of the panels, tech talks, and posters at the symposium, as we will see. Uh, and now it is my great pleasure to uh, introduce Dr. Karen Plow, Executive Vice President for Research at Purdue University. And Dr. Plow oversees Purdue the 600 million research enterprise and is responsible for university-wide strategic initiative and bringing together researchers and researchers across the traditional academic borders to drive interdisciplinary discoveries with societal impact. She joined Purdue in 2010 as Associate Dean for Research and served as Dean for the College of Agriculture until January of this year. Uh, we are very happy that she's joining us today, and please do join me Adam. in welcoming Dr. Yeah. Can Bob. you cut the slide? Yeah. Thank you, Dong Yang. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, to talk to you just for a couple minutes about the future. It, it's really exciting. And when I look at everyone in this room, the impact that you will have on the future is unbelievable. It's um, just an area that continues to grow and really impacts everything we do. And because of that, uh, you're really on the cutting edge of so many different fields. Um, it's scary too because what you do impacts so many things in so many different ways. So I think of, uh, I don't know how many years ago it was, uh, 
probably five or seven years ago when I was in a meeting and they were talking about cybersecurity and it was actually in relation to medicine. And they were talking about the potential to interfere with someone's uh, pacemaker. Those kind of things are real and they're scary. Um, so the work you do can make such a big difference before that it never even occurred to me, first of all, why somebody would want to do that, but more importantly, that somebody can do those kinds of things. And that was seven years ago. That was just the tip of the iceberg of what we're doing now. And as we move forward and talk about AI and all the challenges we see moving forward and all the different things that can happen, deep fakes and things like that, we're really in a new world and you're really on the frontier of that uh, world. And so I think the idea that this is the second state of Indiana academic alliance for cybersecurity is really exciting because it means no one can do this alone. We as a state are embracing uh, what's really important to the future. Um, it's great to have you all here in person. And I also particularly want to thank Sirius for their 20th, 5th anniversary and congratulate them. That's quite an accomplishment. You know, I'm talking about seven years ago, I became kind of aware of this. And we're talking about people that 25 years ago understood the importance of this area for the future of our country. And just like those 25 years passed, I'm sure there's going to be another 25 years, 50 years of how important this area is. It really is across, sorry, a cross cutting topic. And I mentioned, um, medicine, but we can mention so many different areas, autonomous vehicles, biomedical systems, critical infrastructures. Um, I look at my own car, I have a Honda CRV, real fancy, not really. Um, but my Honda CRV sometimes does crazy things. It's not cybersecurity, but it's like kind of surprising and shows just the number of areas. I don't think anybody's bugging my car, but uh, it does do crazy things occasionally, like open the windows or the roof or things that you don't want it to do. And it just goes to how important this area is. Uh, you know, it's critical infrastructure, it's manufacturing. When we think about the future of all the transportation uh, vehicles going down the road and what can happen if somebody hacks into those types of systems, and you can create real havoc. Uh, it's supply chains, it's agriculture and food systems. There are so many opportunities uh, as we move to these autonomous systems in agriculture, uh, which is an area I know something about that you can have major, major impact. Um, so it's the work you do is just really, really important, but it's not just the academic work. It's so many of our partners, which are here today that foster that uh, interdisciplinary work. Uh, to address these new cybersecurity challenges and opportunities. And across Indiana, there are nine colleges and universities that are NSA designated centers for academic excellence in cybersecurity. That's pretty remarkable and really impressive. Um, but uh, Purdue, in particular, was one of the originals back in the 1980s. They became one of the original seven NSA designated centers for academic excellence. At Purdue, there are 160 faculty from 20 different departments across eight colleges that are applying their expertise to these areas. So to security, privacy, resiliency of cyber, and as Don Yen mentioned, the importance of physical systems um, for the future. They work on really every different aspect. And uh, one of the things Purdue prides itself is going from discovery to application. So we have people working on the discovery and the theory to research and development, to application and practice, to education and workforce development, and even standards, laws, and policies around this area. And really make an impact. We need all of these different areas. That's what makes us um, move forward. And actually, I was looking at the comics. Oh, you, I thought, no wonder why people are actually looking at me. I was looking at the comics before, but they're not up anymore. Uh, they were quite entertaining, entertaining, but you saw they went across many, many different areas. And it just shows the importance of that. Uh, Sirius has been a long uh, partner for national security and the technology core team and really explores key areas, not only in some of these things like cars, but certainly national security and defense. Um, 
The other important part is not just us as a university or the universities in Indiana, it's really our partners, which are government and private industry. And um, if you're from government or private industry, just uh, wave. I don't want to make everyone stand up. So uh, the importance of that is you saw how many hands are there. There's a real mix out there today. And that's what's important because it's all of us working together. Um, so this is an opportunity for you to actually mix and mingle and meet people you haven't met before. Um, that's one of the advantages of an in-person conference. It's not just going to the sessions. It's not just listening to various people. It's networking. It's meeting different people. Um, and so take that opportunity to meet somebody you didn't know before you came. And new innovation comes out of those. So please take that opportunity. I just want to remark, it was exactly 20 years ago that Eugene Spafford led the drafting of the landmark 2003 Computing Research Association NSF report on major challenges in cybersecurity. So it's a great time to start identifying the grand challenges for the future. Um, you are the right people to do that. You're here today because you believe in it. And I trust that with a group like this and many others, that will make the difference for us in the future. So I just want to thank you for all the work you do, encourage you to network, have a great time at this in-person meeting, and thanks very much. Thank you, thank you very much. Dr. Paul, thank you very much. Um, so as, as Karen had mentioned, in our, as Don had in his introduction, that uh, Karen is new to this role as of January this year. And uh, uh, this is budget season at the university. So Karen Karen hosted both Don Young and I just this last week and had us on the hot seat and justifying our budgets and how we're going to spend things. But it was, uh, we went way far over our allotted time. Uh, and, and, and while I have a propensity to, to talk all the time, it was actually because Karen was very, very engaged. And so it was very pleased personally for Tony and I to walk out and say, hey, I think we have a, I think we have a vice president of research who really understands what we're doing is important on campus. So thank you. Thank you. And, and thanks for talking, but thank you for your support of the center. So with our first formal talk for the uh, event, I, it's my pleasure to introduce our, our first co-speakers. Uh, they both come from the same organization of the FBI. Uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce uh, uh, find it here. Uh, Herbert Stapleton, the special agent in charge, and Jeffrey Miller, a special agent with the FBI. Gentlemen, welcome. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, we're okay on mics. Yeah, I think I can hear myself pretty well. Okay, great. Hey, uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for uh, giving us the opportunity to speak with you this morning. Um, as Joel mentioned, I'm Herb. Uh, this is Jeff, and we're going to uh, try something that we've never tried before, so hopefully it goes really well, or maybe it goes not so well. You can tell us afterwards, but uh, uh, so typically, uh, sometimes Jeff will go out and give presentations and things like this about um, sort of his role as a cyber special agent and what we do in cyber in the FBI. And sometimes I'll go out uh, as the special agent in charge or sort of the head of the office here in Indiana and talk about um, sort of uh, what the strategic view of the FBI is from a cyber perspective. I spent a few years as an executive in our cyber division before I came out um, here uh, just a little over a year ago to be the special agent in charge in Indiana. And uh, so uh, some, some really smart folks who work uh, with me in the office say, why don't we marry these two things together and see if we can talk about it kind of from both perspectives. So we're gonna give that a try. Um, you know, we'll talk a little bit upfront about the big picture of cyber in the FBI and how we're structured here in Indiana. And uh, Jeff has some, um, you know, has some information um, related to his work, um, you know, specific threat vectors that we see kind of most often um, and then uh, we might take a pause in the middle of our hour and take a few Q and A's on that part. And then Jeff has a case example uh, that I think I'm going to step aside and get out of the way and let him talk about because that uh, that may be the most interesting part of the whole thing. So um, with that being said, we're going to jump right into it. Jeff, you're going to run the uh, you're running you the slides. It. Okay, great. Um, you can tell this is a people rehearsed. So uh, um, let me start off by talking uh, a little bit about um, kind of how the FBI is structured cyber-wise. Many of you may know this, but uh, some of you may not. So let me share that. 
And then I'll share kind of how that applies here in, in Indiana. Um, you know, the FBI uh, spent almost 100 years working threats that were geographically based. Uh, we could say there's organized crime in Chicago. We need to put more uh, organized crime FBI agents in Chicago, right? And so when we started doing cyber work, I think we we largely followed that model because it's been a successful model. But as all of you here know, and I won't belabor the point, that's not really how cyber works. That's how cyber threats work. Um, they're not geographically based. The theater in which we sort of operate is, um, is a virtual one for uh, in large part. And so the actors themselves, as we all know, can be anywhere in the world. And in fact, not only can they be anywhere in the world, but they are everywhere in the world. So. Um, we had to think of a different kind of way to structure um, our model for uh, for investigating cyber threats. And when I talk about um, investigating cyber threats, I think it's important to remember that the FBI is both a law enforcement and an intelligence agency. And so we are really looking at that cyber threat um, from the perspective of trying to identify who we can put handcuffs on, uh, indict, arrest, and put in jail. Uh, for criminal activity, but also looking at sort of the national security threats that are posed both by uh, nation state actors and, and honestly, um, the, the national security threats that are posed by um, for profit criminal actors and things like, you know, think ransomware against critical infrastructure, right? Like that's financially motivated, but certainly a national security threat. And we have an obligation as an intelligence agency to also push out information. And we'll talk about that a little bit later on share information with our government partners um, in the intelligence community, share information with potential victims, share information with uh, private sector companies who might be able to do things that aren't really within the, uh, the FBI's tool belt and also um, lend our, our own authorities to the effort to disrupt cyber threats uh, against, against the United States. So all that being said, you know, the decision was made a number of year, years ago to go to a less geographically based um, focus and a more um, sort of threat based focus. And so we have teams of cyber agents in all 56 field offices all across the country um, who are responsible for responding to victims within those areas of responsibility, but also who are subject matter experts in certain types of threats that we face. So it could be a particular actor set, it could be a particular ransomware group, it could be kind of any of those things. And they're the subject matter experts uh, in that particular area. And then we have a network of, um, uh, of cyber squads all over the country who can be on uh, virtually anyone's doorstep uh, in the United States within a couple of hours uh, to respond to, uh, to any kind of incident or concern that might happen. So that's the big picture of how the FBI is structured from a, from a cyber perspective. Um, I, I want to say this one thing about where I think we fit into that cyber landscape. I think, the, I think that the FBI is in a really unique position. We haven't always recognize that as well as we should, but I think we're doing better on that front. And that is we really sit as almost a pivot point between the offensive and defensive um, cyber mission. You know, the FBI is responsible for working with network defenders, um, both in the government and the, in the private sector. These information that we have gleaned through our investigations and not to sort of silo or sit on that, but to make sure that that gets out there into um, uh, in, into your own efforts to defend your networks. We also um, have an obligation to uh, both use our own tools um, and, to, uh, and to enable operations of other agencies when it's time to go on offense against the actors. I don't think that um, a 100% offensive approach or a 100% defensive approach is really gonna be effective in mitigating, not eliminating, but mitigating the cyber threats that we face. It has to be a holistic approach, and the FBI works in both sides of, uh, of those sort of aisles. So when you think network defenders um, in, the, uh, in the government, think CISO, right? Think DHS CISO. Our obligation to work with them um, to make sure that we are, you know, sort of uh, aligned in how we are presenting information to the public. And I hope those of you who consume those types of products have seen more alignment recently than you might have seen in the past. And, and maybe we're not perfect yet, but I think we're getting there. When you think offense, think about a lot of three-letter agencies that probably can't talk about in this room, right? So, um, but it, it is our obligation. There are a number of um, agencies uh, in the in, within the federal government, within the intelligence community, who have authorities that um, 
that they can use more effectively if we are working with them. So we really endeavor uh, in the time that I spent in cyber revision all the way up to, to today to do a better job of that. And I, I think we've made a lot of progress. All right. So in Indiana, we bring all that down. So Jeff is one of our um, one of our cyber agents in Indiana. Um, we have about eleven cyber agents in Indiana for the uh, for the squad. That doesn't mean they're the only people who can conduct an investigation on the internet, but these are really sort of our trade of cyber SMEs, and they are focused specifically on cyber threats. Um, in addition to the investigators, we employ intelligence analysts who uh, have cyber backgrounds. We employ um, uh, we employ uh, computer scientists uh, who support Jeff and uh, other agents on the squad in their investigations so that they can focus on the investigating part. And there's somebody who can uh, focus on some of the more technical aspects of that. Not that Jeff and his guys can't do that, but it is uh, but two heads are better than one, so, or three heads better than one when it comes to this type of stuff. And so we employ those specific people who are very technologically inclined and committed to the mission, but maybe not interested in being a patching gun carrier. Um, and uh, that's been a very successful, um, uh, that's been sort of been a successful endeavor for us in the FBI, uh, in my opinion. And then finally, um, a number of other kind of tactical analyst positions like digital operations specialists and people who specialize in sort of working with big data. That's a fairly new um, endeavor in the FBI. But again, I think what we have to do to be able to move ourselves sort of forward and keep up with the volume of uh, threat intelligence that we see, um, it's, it, that's probably our biggest challenge. Like the volume of data, the volume of threat intelligence that's out there is um, is really more than, um, than we're equipped to handle from like a human perspective, obviously. And so we need to get better in how we uh, work with that data visualization and, and all those sorts of things that I won't dive too deep into the details about. Um, those agents are responsible for the whole state of Indiana. So uh, Jeff sits here in Lafayette. We have some folks down in headquarters city. But if there's a cyber incident uh, of significance in the state of Indiana, then um, those are the people who are going to respond. And um, and so in addition to being um, victim focused here within the state of Indiana, uh, our team also has responsibilities for specific threats, both on the national security uh, and on the criminal side. That we are the the leaders um, in for the whole country, for the whole FBI, really in a lot of ways for the whole world, um, because a lot of these uh, a lot of these investigations are joined with um, international law enforcement or intelligence agencies, and so um, those folks here in Indiana are sort of the leaders for those particular threats. Um, so that's been said. That's the big structure of the uh, of the FBI and uh, here in Indiana. So Jeff. Um, I think it's up, it's up to you. Sure. So we receive thousands of complaints each year, and we compile those results to come up with a yearly end of uh, uh, year data points. And while all these computer-driven vectors are should not be new to any of you, um, almost all the intrusions that we see or that are reported to us break down to these basic categories. Uh, compromised credentials, uh, which often happen stuffing and spraying, all the data breaches, um, obviously, that is still very easy. Uh, these actors always take the path of least resistance, um, and so you always see them starting in this arena. And you'll see some commonalities between all of these. It's the human factor, right? No matter how much money and resources you dedicate to protect your networks and systems, um, the weakest link is always the human factor, whether it's compromised credentials, password reuse, social engineering, and spear phishing. Um, those attacks are getting more sophisticated day by day. It's not as obvious to catch. Anymore, there aren't the typos. It's not English is not their first language, um, so those are getting much more sophisticated. Unpatched systems. That one's kind of bubbling up towards the top lately. Um, government data has suggested recently that uh, most of the systems that are affected by these vulnerabilities patches have existed for several years. The most known CVEs. Now we understand it's not always practical to patch your systems right away. And it takes time to vet them in a, in a sample environment, uh, make sure you're not going to break other systems. But that always bubbles to the top. Misconfigured cloud services and VPN appliances. And with the rise of COVID and working and teleworking, a lot of organizations hastily put together uh, implementations to allow their employees to work from home and remotely. And as a result of that, um, things were misconfigured um, and a lot of breaches happened as a result. Third-party vendors, always knowing who you're granting access to your network and what uh, access they have. You see time and time again, companies report, well, 
the intrusion vector was, say, um, you were a third party data processor or um, the HVAC system. People that have access to their systems, but not really going through and double checking what access those vendors have. And you can protect your network as hard as you want, but you're still as vulnerable as they are. So if they're not conforming to your standards of security, you might want to double check it um, and always make sure they rise to that level. And obviously, insider threat. And that can kind of go to one of two ways. Either it's the disgruntled employee who leaves and takes things with them, or someone who leaves, credentials aren't turned off after they leave. And that happens from time and time again. Um, they're left in uh, the directory for months, years. Uh, then they come back that may be disgruntled years later, we've even seen. And they test their credentials, and lo and behold, they work. Now, as part of our uh, yearly report, uh, read by our Internet uh, Crime Center for all the online submissions for uh, internet based fraud, they compile a really nice report. And if you haven't viewed it, I really highly suggest you do ic3.gov. Um, they have the overview for the entire nation as well as broken down threats by state. So we'll go through some of the overview of the threats across the nation and more specifically as they relate here to Indiana. Um, this last year in 2022, investment fraud. Uh, Took the, the threshold is the highest uh, crime loss with $3.3 billion, which is just staggering. Um, that investment fraud is kind of um, broken down into some other categories, more specifically uh, cryptocurrency theft. Um, we've seen a drastic increase, whether it's because of the market, um, you know, having its issues lately and people trying to diversify and uh, learn new things. Pig butchering is the term that's used for the, the biggest threat in that realm. Um, essentially, it means there's an individual that meets someone, whether it's on a dating website, uh, or random errant text message, uh, or a social media account. So the bad actors build trust with these individuals, uh, say, hey, we've got this uh, investment scheme. I've made thousands of dollars. You should also invest. Now, me talking to you, you think, well, that's easy to spot, right? But these individuals spend months garnering that trust and building up that relationship before they make that pitch. And the sites that they employ look like legitimate crypto exchanges um, down to logins. When you log in, you can see your investment. It's growing day by day, several thousands of dollars. But then when the individuals attempt to take out their funds, they're hit with a tax bill for another 20, 30, $40,000, in addition to all the money that they've invested in crypto. Um, unfortunately, we've seen individuals move as little as $50,000, which is still a lot, um, up to $1.2, $1 $1.3 million for one individual. So as you can see, that just is a cascading snowball that really, really hit the $3.3 billion relatively quickly. Business uh, email compromise and email account compromise, those don't go away. It's the shotgun approach. Um, it's very profitable for these individuals. So it's definitely the number two uh, category. Tech support. Um, it's kind of fallen off over over the years, but it's still obviously eight hundred million dollars worth of losses. Typically, targets people over sixty, as we'll see in some later slides. Um, again, getting a little bit more sophisticated. It's not as egregious as it was in years past. The personal data breach. That one can kind of be rolled into the cryptocurrency as well. Uh, personal email accounts and people store passwords or uh, crypto wallets in online accounts. So those. Personal data breaches then lead to the investment or the email account compromise. So they kind of go hand in hand. And then confidence, fraud, and romance um, that also can be supported by the cryptocurrency schemes and the pig butchering. Now, here for Indiana, these are the top losses by victim amount. The business email compromise, email account compromise, $22 million. And if you see the three in the middle, they're all associated with crypto or um, a subset, and those total over $21 million just here for Indiana. So as you can see, that is the highest profitable scheme that these actors do lately, um, and they're all doing it remotely outside the United States, um, and it's very effective. This one kind of surprised me. Uh, these are the number of individuals here in Indiana that filed complaints with IC3. Now, this is Indiana specific, but the largest category of complainants came from the 40 to 49 year range. Um, I, like most people, would assume it would be the over 60 or 50 to 59. Um, so it just kind of tells you that it's not just targeting the older individuals, it's everyone across the board. 
Now, if you expand it out to nationwide, you will see what you would expect to see. The six, over 60 has the majority of the losses. I think it's about 3.1 billion for 2022, followed by 50 to 59, which is significantly less, but still a lot at about 1.8 billion. Um, and then it goes on up the chain. But here specifically for Indiana, it seems to be the 40 to 49. And if you're not from the state, you can go on ic3.gov and see the 66 for your area. Quite certainly. And here in Indiana, these are the uh, stats by number of victims. Um, obviously, personal data breaches up there, non-payment delivery, identity theft. What you don't see in any of these lists is a ransomware. I don't know if anyone picked up on that. And there's a reason for that. Last year, we received, as a nation, close to 2,400 complaints on ransomware, which you would expect to be significantly higher, right? Um, and there, I think there's a, a couple of reasons for that. One, this is just based on IC3 data. So individuals come to the portal, submit um, an online uh, submission that comes to us. Now, this does not take into account the individuals who report it directly to the FBI. Um, of those 2,400 complaints that we did receive through IC3, they totaled about $34 million in losses, which also seems low, but take uh, out the... Um, Remediation costs, third-party vendors, uh, loss of service, downtime, none of that is factored into that $34 million. That's simply the extortion amount that may have or may not have been paid, or the double extortion amount if the data is posted online um, to prevent that from happening. Um, so you see that it's not here, but obviously that's the elephant in the room. Ransomware has been the biggest cash cow for these groups. So you might ask, why work with the FBI? And I would say, why not? And I know that kind of is counterintuitive for a lot of people in the room. Government agency, we're not going to share all of our data with them. But I think when you understand what we have to offer, I think it's kind of a no-brainer why you wouldn't want to engage with us, even at a minimum. We have 56 field offices across the United States. Um, in addition to that, we have 63 offices worldwide with FBI agents stationed in embassies and consulates that interact on a daily basis with our foreign partners. Now, that is extremely integral into the success that we have in cybercrime, in the combating and the arrest portion. Um, without our foreign partners, none of it would be possible. So our reach isn't just here in the United States. It extends across the world. Um, we, give, we have access to intelligence. I know if some of you may have been engaged with the FBI in the past, you might have shared information and then never heard anything back. Does that happen to anyone here? Don't raise your hand. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> We're working on that. And what I mean by that is if, if you have information, we are trying to be better uh, stewards in the community about sharing, right? We're not always going to be able to provide information back. Some of it may be classified. Maybe you have someone that's cleared in your organization that could receive that intelligence. That's a different matter. Uh, but if it's unclassified, we could provide you some other indicators that maybe you didn't know about. Maybe you're a threat until the incident response company that you hired you weren't aware of. Um, it's as simple as phoning your local FBI office and wanting to meet with someone. If you already have a contact, feel free to email, call. That's what we're here for. And a lot of people think they're too busy. They're not going to respond. We're really making a concerted effort to pay it back and share that information because it doesn't just benefit us. It benefits everyone um, when you break it down. And then it also helps streamline the process. If we already have an established relationship, when an incident happens, it's not if, it's when. It's just a matter of time. But then we know who to go to. What information do you keep? What, how long is your log retention? Are you going to hire outside legal counsel? Will your attorneys be the, uh, the uh, point of contact for any incident moving forward? Um, what information are you going to be able to share? Um, so just establishing those baselines out of the gate or ahead of time saves so much time in the investigation because a lot of the evidence that we seek is transitory. It could be gone three months, six months. So typical response time for someone finding the intrusion, three to six months on average. Um, so you can see we're already behind uh, when we start. So if we know exactly what you have and how we can use that, we're off to the races. So Jeff, let me say a couple of things about, um, about working with the FBI and the benefits. And I think one of the things that uh, I try to do when I speak to groups like this and, and other groups is talk about expectations. I think, you know, um, in smaller groups, I, I, I sometimes get feedback uh, or some more larger groups. I sometimes get feedback about um, a company or an entity who's worked with the FBI and who says, 
well, you guys didn't tell me anything we didn't already know. And um, like, honestly, that happens a lot. That's, that's going to be the case uh, in a lot of instances because, uh, as I mentioned earlier, so many different sort of sources of uh, threat intelligence and a lot of that information overlaps and it is duplicative. And so there's, there's a really, there's a possibility, a strong possibility that when you work with us, we say, this is what we know about, let's just say your company or uh, somebody you're working with is a victim of a ransomware. And we say, this is what we know about XYZ ransomware. Uh, there's always the possibility that you're going to say, hey, already knew all of that. You know, thanks for your help. Um, and so I, I like to temper the expectations a little bit about what the FBI is going to do. We're not sitting on stacks and stacks of information that nobody else knows. But what we do have is we have information that we have obtained through uh, our legal authorities, our unique legal authorities, things that other people can't get for whatever reason. Um, and we, and a lot of that information, we are legally prohibited from putting that out in a bulletin, right? So we, we can't say, we can't say, hey, everybody listen to this, because of the way that we obtain that information, we can't actually put it out there. But what we can do when we have a victim is we can work with that victim or we can share with an incident response company on one-off or, uh, or, or small group basis to say, okay, we, we saw this exact same sort of issue in Houston last week or wherever it is, right? And so here are some things to look for. And that happens, um, I don't want to pretend that that happens in the majority of cases, but it happens in a significant minority. It happens significantly enough that if I were in the shoes of an incident responder um, or in the shoes of um, a CISO for a company who uh, was going through a cyber event, I would want to know. I, I, I would at least want to explore that particular avenue. And the second thing that I'll say is that I think there are a number of myths out there um, that people have uh, sort of developed uh, about working with the FBI in the aftermath of a cyber incident. That are a little harmful to our to our corporate efforts, our, our um, sort of team efforts to try to uh, be more effective against the uh, against the cyber threat. One of those myths is that you know there's always sort of this fear of what's going to happen with regulators when you are the victim of a cyber incident, and so there's uh, this fear that working with the FBI or reporting to the FBI increases the likelihood of potential regulatory scrutiny. Uh, I, I have not. That's not been my experience. First of all, the FBI doesn't have any obligation to turn over any information to a regulator. That the company, it's that the regulated entity itself doesn't have the obligation to turn over to a regulator. So, um, you know, you can take for that way, you, you know, like that as you will. But um, we we don't have any extra obligations beyond what uh, obligations are already imposed by law. And secondly, we actually don't do that. That's the that's really the obligation of the of the regulated entity. Our job is to investigate a federal crime, um, collect intelligence, and protect the national security. Um, and so, and then the other part of that is what I've actually experienced, and there have been a number of sort of uh, regulatory frameworks that are moving toward this type of uh, this type of setup, which is basically that. And I get points on the board if you work with the government, right? So um, if you are the victim of a cyber incident and you call law enforcement, that um, you know there is there are some safe harbor type provisions that apply to in, in certain areas. And I, I'm not an expert in that area and I won't dig too deep in it. But but one of the examples I can give you is um, if you're familiar with OPAC sanctions uh, against uh, a number of um, ransomware actors that are out there, known ransomware groups. One of the one of the key aspects of those OPAC sanctions is that um, if you have reported to law enforcement um, and have you know gotten back information that indicates that we don't have any knowledge uh, that, that this is a sanctioned entity and you pay, there are protections in place for you if you do that. Um, you know, check the OFAC sanction regulations yourself or with your attorney to make sure that you get that exactly right. But that was actually, I helped build that into when OFAC was talking about sanctioning ransomware actors, I helped build that into that process because what we don't want to do is chill the reporting of ransomware cases because people are afraid that if they report, they're gonna uh, and and they need to pay that. That ultimately, 
um, they're going to uh, they're going to have a problem because of the uh, because of the impacts. And so those are some exam. That's one example of how reporting to law enforcement actually can help in the regulatory process versus uh, versus the burden. Those are excellent points, and I will say on that line of ransomware, um, we understand um, there are going to be situations where victims will pay. There's not going to be any shame associated with that from our perspective. Now, as a good law enforcement agency, we always recommend you don't pay. It's an extortion at the end of the day. We understand that you have to protect your brand and your business, and that might be the only option to save the company um, from complete disaster. So we, we completely understand that. There are some additional resources that we have at our disposal. Uh, the NJTF, it's a group of it's 24, but I think it's up to 30 different uh, organizations now from law enforcement, the intel community, as well as the DOD for information sharing. The NCFTA, the National Cyber Threat and Forensic Alliance, um, they're based in Pittsburgh. Uh, they collaborate with a lot of the large finance institutions and share cyber threat uh, intel back and forth. We have access to that information. This is a new one that most people don't know about. It's the Cyber Cyber Behavioral Analysis Team. Um, so everyone thinks criminal minds or you know violent crime. We also have a team that works just cyber cases, and it's been very beneficial uh, to help uh, understand the mindset and the pattern of these groups and individuals to help break cases wide open. Cyberwatch is a group that's around twenty four seven for uh, complaints. Uh, if there's something urgent, they'll take it out to the field, make sure that we get on it right away. Cyber Task Force, we pull from local law enforcement as well as other agencies and individuals throughout the community to help bolster uh, our know-how and knowledge to respond to these cases. And then IC3, which we discussed in great length. Some of the information sharing that Stapleton had mentioned, we have uh, FBI flashes, just flash alerts. When we do have information that we can share, we'd like to get that out as fast as possible. Uh, we do that through our flash, flash messages. Uh, private industry notifications, our pins. If you sign up for the various uh, different industry uh, categories, you can receive critical alerts through our pin notifications. And then the public service announcements that you see all the time. So one thing I'll add to that uh, to that particular slide that we, um, th those products are all very, very helpful. One of the things you may have seen more of recently is uh, joint cybersecurity advisories. Um, one of the things that we ran into when I was back at Cyber Division is we had multiple, so, and, and primarily the players there were the FBI, the NSA, and uh, DHS, CISA, uh, Secret Service also to a certain extent on certain threats. But we had um, all those three or four government agencies putting out similar information through different channels at different times. And it was really confusing and kind of overwhelming for, um, for the consumer. And so what you'll see but, you know, sometimes we don't sort of have the same view on those threats, right? Like, so it may be that we think it's important to get this out, and uh, one of our sister agencies may think, yeah, no, we don't want to be a part of that. But what you probably will see a lot more of are joint CSAs or cybersecurity advisories that are either dual or um, triple sealed with the FBI, the NSA, and CISA. And what I tell people a lot about that is um, if you see the FBI, CISA, and NSA seal on a cybersecurity advisory is probably important. So uh, I would I would take note of that. Um, and, and again, sometimes it'll be things um, that you already know about, and we get that. But um, you know, surprising. It, I, I'm sort of I should stop being surprised, but I'm always surprised at how much um, how often we find things that we think are sort of broadly known. Uh, throughout the community that continue to victimize people over and over to, to Jeff's point about uh, unpatched vulnerabilities. I mean, I think a good example of that particular phenomenon is, um, that, you know, there was the vulnerability that, um, and this was a couple of years ago, but there was the vulnerability that Microsoft attributed to a group they called Happy, and if you recall that, and, you know, Microsoft did some amazing work to, like, push out uh, patches and fixes for that vulnerability. They pushed it up everybody who had that particular thing. And there was, were still, I, I had something in the neighborhood of, um, I, it was in the thousands. I, I'm, if I quote the number, I'm going to get it wrong, but it was a lot. Thousands of people who didn't take those actions to the point where, if you recall, the FBI actually went to court, got legal process, and used our legal authorities to actually go onto those networks and, and follow Microsoft's instructions to fix that. 
a good example, uh, in my mind, a good example of how, like, um, for the power of private industry and a company like Microsoft, and they'll get much more powerful than that, um, along with the authorities of the FBI, can be, can go out and sort of use sort of um, fix things that people just decide not to pay attention to. Now, for some of those things that were just kind of like nobody cared about anymore, weren't really attached to anything we need to be concerned about, probably. Uh, but there's really no way to know that without um, without learning the hard way. So um, I'll say just a couple of uh, things about connecting with the FBI. Jeff has been kind enough to put his phone number uh, on this slide and not my phone number on this slide, which is really uh, which is really kind. But uh, not because I don't want people to reach out to me, but um, because if you really want somebody who knows what they're talking about, you probably want to talk to Jeff. Um, I think there are a, a number of other ways uh, uh, to connect with the FBI in ways that are um, beneficial for you. Uh, I would say that, you know, if your company, um, if you are part of a company or an institution, uh, an academic institution that is doing um, research or that is in the business of working um, in critical infrastructure that could be, you know, let's say extremely disruptive to like the power grid or something like that. Or if you're doing um, the kind of work that uh, foreign adversaries um, would like to get their hands on to use as a technological advantage over the United States, um, if you're doing the kind of work um, that could be majorly disruptive to our economy, um, we want to work with you directly, right? Like we literally want you to walk away here, call Jeff, and say, "I think we need to talk." Um, and uh, we'll, we're always happy to have that conversation. And that doesn't mean we're going to meet every week, but I think it's a conversation that we need to have and it's better for us to know each other in advance. Um, if you're not in that line of business, but you're worried about cyber threats, we still want to connect with you. But I think there are better ways um, to work with the FBI that don't require such a um, necessarily hands-on approach. Of course, we're always willing to have a conversation in forums like this. Come up and talk to Jeff or I after this, um, this presentation. Um, uh, InfraGuard, if you're not familiar with the InfraGuard program, it is a really good way to sort of stay abreast of what the FBI is doing and have a conduit into the FBI if you need it, but maybe what you do doesn't require a sort of uh, a routine touch. And so those, those are a couple of things I would recommend if you're, um, if you're interested in having more of a relationship with the FBI on, on cyber matters. So. Is that it? That's, that's, that's great. It. Okay, that's so great. what I'd like to do, I think we have a full hour, right? Yes. Okay. So what I'd like to do is, um, I, I want Jeff, we've got about 30 minutes left, and I want Jeff to get his case to example, because I think you guys will enjoy it. But maybe we could pause and just get any questions about the FBI's approach, working with the FBI on um, cyber matters, any, any questions that we could answer about that. And maybe we'll take like five minutes of questions and then jump in. There's already two hands up, so that's a good sign. So, sir, uh, I think there's a microphone here, and then I saw I saw a hand in the back, sir. You can be next, yeah. Uh, good morning. Yep, we got you. Okay. Uh, I have some here, so maybe I can do the phone sample and see the statement of what happened. I actually have two questions. I should have brief answers. In your first uh, data breach, what were the development sources of the data breach? And then secondly, what's the status of the record guard? I have been in the past for a long time. When they said they're coming back up, I just got to do the recertification crickets. So what's going on that? Thank you. Okay. Um, as soon as I see the regard, somebody who asked that question. So uh, uh, I don't have an answer for you right now. Uh, the last, uh, and I can certainly check on that. We can get back to you. But uh, uh, the last I checked, um, there, so remember, there are hundreds of thousands of research questions that need to be done. So it's going to be, it, it's a process that's going to take time, uh, but I don't have an exact status to give you. On the other one, so um, in the IC3 data, it doesn't sort of break it down by the sources of that data, but Jeff could probably give some insight in what we see most often here. Yeah, typically we see it's, you know, social media or cryptocurrency accounts. Those are the latest for the last, I'd say, 18 months or so. Probably skewed more towards cryptocurrency accounts. Thank you. Yes, sir. Actually, you already answered my first question. <laughs> I'm moving really, really well. I can turn back to Connecticut. Um, the second one, I just forgot. Uh, oh, yes. Um, in the IC3 stats, um, 
I remember seeing a report, I think I made it in the Verizon Media report, where they said the VEC was actually larger than ransomware if you scrub the cost of remediation. Have you seen any, any implications of that? So, uh, yeah, I mean, that's what our data suggests. I, I think that, unfortunately, that the ransomware, and I used to work at IC3, a lot of the stuff that you saw up here was stuff that, that I worked on to kind of build. And, and one of the problems with IC3 data, uh, extremely dirty, right? <laughs> I don't mean like, I mean in the sense that um, there's open text where, um, you know, complainants who range from like CISO at a Fortune 500 company to your great grandmother can write in anything that they want to. And so um, that's a that's a little bit of a challenge. And so I think that the IC3 ransomware data uh, from a loss perspective is uh, is problematic, um, even beyond just the fact that we know that it's just grossly underreported. Like we are getting just a sliver of the actual ransomware incidents reported to the FBI. And we know that because there are companies that have better insight into that than we do. Um, and so I think it's hard to say like dollar for dollar, which one is really greater, but I would say until this year, if you go back like a decade or so, you'll see BBC as the largest total loss amount um, for years and years. And so um, I, I can't say exactly which one is, is larger dollar for dollar, but we definitely do see larger amounts of loss from BBC reported to the FBI than we do from ransomware. The other thing I'll say about the, uh, the BBC data, by contrast, is, probably, is pretty reliable. Um, because uh, number one, we largely get sort of we have corporate victims. So we have um, you know people in businesses who are reporting those losses versus individuals by and large. So it's uh, that can be more reliable. And number two, like if there's one thing you should report to the IC3, it's BEC because we can actually do something about it in a lot of cases. You know, if it's reported within 72 hours or so, uh, we have the opportunity. We have a team at the IC3 dedicated to actually going back and trying to freeze those funds before they get transferred through sort of the bank's wire system overseas. And then, you know, there's sort of legal things that have to happen to get that return to the uh, to the victim. The hundreds of millions of dollars over the past you know, three years have been recovered uh, for victims as a result of that. So I, I think, so people know that and they're like, okay, I'm going to report BEC and it's going to be like real information because uh, we can actually lose it. Uh, a great question. Thank you. Yep. Uh, one more question, maybe, and I'll let Jeff. Yes, ma'am. I'm Dini Gudiharto. I have been a CISO mostly for oil and gas companies from the Republic of Texas. Quick questions on the different resources that the FBI uh, provides, right? The IC3 and so forth. And some of our organizations also member of ISAC mm -hmm. in the oil and gas or in the ISAC. How do you integrate that information? Is it all part of that ISAC that we only go to one source or do we still need to converge um, with the FBI as well? So um, my opinion is that, you, you know, unfortunately, I, I think that um, the resources that we showed up on that screen, they serve different purposes uh, than the ISAC do, in my opinion. And so, uh, and then again, like all the ISACs are a little different in how they're run too. And you're probably familiar with that, you know, like the oil and gas is not this is not sort of run in the same way as the aviation. So I would say what those resources that we showed you on that screen are focused on, um, they are more focused on real time um, collaboration over threat intelligence. The ISAC, uh, I, I don't have experience with the oil and gas ISAC, but other ISACs in my experience have been um, less focused on real-time collaboration. And so the bottom line is that yes, like the FBI, we try to work with the ISACs um, in, in the same way that you know, we work with DHS and DHS is responsible for the ISACs, um, but we are not, uh, we don't typically use that as the sole form for pushing out information. Um, and I don't see that changing. Um, in the near future. I, I, I know that's that's probably a point of frustration for some people, but uh, I think that, so NCFTA, for example, um, you know, NCFTA partners um, work directly, are directly embedded with an FBI unit that is responsible for working on, you know, uh, things of interest to that particular, um, to that particular membership. And so, 
it, it's a little bit more collaborative environment and there's a little bit more um, ongoing real time uh, kind of collaboration on cyber threat intelligence versus sort of a uh, period, you know, periodic meeting where you gather together and do those things. Maybe in the future we'll uh, find a better way to do that. Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, okay, so let's <clears throat> shift here and let uh, Jeff talk a little bit about a case example. Um, and Jeff, maybe um, if we make it through, uh, we can take a few more questions at the end. Sure. All right. I'm going to step aside though and let the power through make sure we have some yep. questions. So it's not always the case where we're able to start with an intrusion and end with the subject who's a foreign national, but get him here in custody. But this was one of the uh, situations where that was the case. Uh, it started in 2012, these various companies. And the breakdown of this organization, it's kind of what you would expect from a Fortune 500 company, but slanted towards the cyber criminal realm. You have the hackers who steal the data, the brooders who crack the passwords to make them usable, the broker who helps facilitate the sale of those stolen credentials or data, the high-end buyers of that data, and then the cash-out services, how they're going to launder the money or make the proceeds usable. So back in the summer of 2012, it was the summer of breaches. I don't know how many people remember, but in just a few short months, there were about 264 million user credentials that were out in the wild, whether it was the LinkedIn credentials that were about 6.5 million, uh, that were leaked on um, the Russian forum Inside Pro, uh, FormSpring, and then there's 30 million on the same forum, um, and then Dropbox with 67 million. So the intrusion vector into LinkedIn was a little bit more sophisticated than you would think for 2012. Um, the individual that was targeted was a site reliability engineer. He had access to databases and internal systems. He was running a personal uh, karate website. Uh, that he participated in on his home iMac uh, in, a, in a VM. So relatively, you would think, secure, um, not from these actors. They realized that the LinkedIn data was extremely valuable and they wanted to get access. So, and they were very persistent. So they figured out how to compromise that web server, the Apache web server. Now they're on the VM locally. Now they have to figure out how to break out. Well, after a lot of time and, and effort, they try to uh, crack the SSH password, can't do it. Uh, they finally realized that screen sharing is on between the VM and the host iMac. So they're able to hop from the VM into the host machine. And unfortunately, but lucky for the actors, uh, once they're on the host machine, they see the SSH keys for the LinkedIn corporate network sitting there. Now, back in 2012, there was some remote work. There wasn't as much policy around what devices you could use to log into the corporate network. So this is pretty uh, commonplace to see. And obviously, once you have SSH keys, the actor takes them um, and he's off to the races to seal the data. And this is kind of just a quick timeline to show how quickly this progresses. On the sixth, you see him starting to probe uh, the karate website. And then by the 12th, he already has access, uh, persistent access to the box. This is an example of the shell that was dropped on the web server for the persistent access so it didn't get booted out once they got in. Now, once the situation happens at LinkedIn, it's code red. They've never had a breach of this magnitude before. Um, and so it's all hands on deck trying to figure out what the heck happened. And in doing so, they're combing through every log file that they have at their disposal, mainly the VPN log since that was the injury vector. Um, and quickly, they, they determined there's some anomalies in this log. The user, Nick Berry, who resides in the Bay Area, has numerous logins uh, from the Russian Federation. So, of course, they had pull Nick in the comments room and say, hey, Nick, were you in Russia last week or during the time frame? Of course he wasn't. So they started to pivot on these data sets. And as you can see, one of the connections started um, there at the end from the Russian Federation and ended uh, two, about two days later. So in identifying this uh, compromised site reliability engineer's account, they use those data sets, the IP addresses, the browser that they use, and the user agent string, which included the term Sputnik. So it kind of made it a little bit more unique um, and a play on the Russian satellite uh, to look for any other accounts that may have been targeted or compromised. And they come up with an alarming list. And this is just an example of some of the individuals that were targeted. And as you can see there, uh, MySQL engineer, head of product, uh, developer, system administration, people that have credentials that have access to sensitive data. So just like in LinkedIn, now they have access to all this sensitive data. They find other targets of interest, including uh, unfortunate Tom Wigand of Dropbox. 
Um, and talking to Tom, he had password reuse. So the same credentials he used at Dropbox, he used uh, for LinkedIn. So after he gets in, uses his credentials, gets into the corporate network, sends himself an invite to Dropbox for Teams, which was an employees only site. Um, and that was the mechanism that he used to exfil the data out of the network. And as you can see here, just like with Nick Barry, we have Tom Wigan's credentials logging in uh, from numerous Russian IP addresses. It's kind of a rough one. And that's a sample uh, invite to Janus, the, the fake name that was used. Just like with LinkedIn and Dropbox, we have FormSpring, which is a social uh, network company. Uh, it's defunct now, but it had about 30 million users back in 2012. Similar thing, John Sanders' credentials were in the LinkedIn data set, password reuse, get access to the account, not with the data. Very eerily similar to the other two victims. You see logins uh, from Russian IP addresses as well as um, the madness.php uh, shell for persistence. And like Nick, uh, Tom, and John were not in Russia at any point. So, how do we identify the individual victims? A lot of hard work. So, throughout this investigation, we had terabytes of log files and data, whether it's search warrant returns on email accounts. Uh, we had 180 different subpoenas issued for various companies for records, 41 different search warrants and court orders, 32 pen registers, and 10 MLS, which are similar to a foreign search warrant uh, overseas partners. Now, in the beginning, when LinkedIn identifies Nick Barry as the intrusion vector <clears throat> and all these other individuals whose accounts had been targeted and accessed, they find one of, of, of interest, and that is for the user uh, Jamis Guru. Uh, or Jamiro Quattro, uh, using the email address China Big 01. Now, this individual had no links. It had just been registered shortly after the breach um, and was used by the exact same indicators of Tom Rise to access as for the other right though. So, as you can see here, some other individuals targeted from Orange Brain and the China Big account got cut off there. So back in 2012, relations were a little bit more friendly and cordial with, with Russia. So we decided kind of a Hail Mary at the time. We had all these Russian IP addresses accessing the various corporate networks. We aggregated the top three or five and sent it off in a request to Russia to help identify uh, the owner of those IPs. And lo and behold, they actually respond. And the response moved back to uh, Evgeny Alexandrovich Nikulin. And that IP address that's in bold there was the one that was connected to LinkedIn's network uh, for two days, seven hours. Now, that's interesting, right? Why would you use your home IP if you're trying to exfil data uh, from the victim company? And there's really one simple answer, reliability, right? He uses proxies left and right everywhere else, like email accounts, social media accounts. But when it came down to it, when he needed to exfil the data in a large volume, he wanted it to be reliable, and he uses home IP. And that was the limit. There's that login. In an unrelated investigation, another data breach of some companies out west, we interview uh, the Russian individual, Nikita Kisselson, and he filled in as the data broker in this realm from Fly. And in referring and talking to Nikita, he said, yep, I know who hacked LinkedIn and Dropbox, this guy named Yevgeny, he's from Moscow, and this is a direct quote, he called him the Vladimir Putin of the hacking world. Today's not the smartest guy, but he's very persistent and he will get it done. <laughs> and he said he purchased the form spring data from uh, Yevgeny, which also helps. Um, and the timeline of events that he laid out mimicked the intrusions to the team. Um, unfortunately, Yevgeny was upset with Nikita because he wasn't able to turn a profit on the stolen uh, form spring data. And so their relationship fizzled shortly thereafter. Maybe that's why he decided to call him out. We'll never know. Um, in another COVID stream, uh, the Secret Service did a search of uh, the Ukrainian national's house um, in Kiev in 2012. Uh, his name was Alexander Aramenko. He's since been charged uh, publicly. And he was on the OFAC list as well uh, for breaches in the PR Newswire and the Business Wire services for insider trading, made hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, which would make sense given the ecosystem here. And then he was friends with Yevgeny. Yevgeny has access to credentials for individuals across a wide spectrum, these individuals then exploited. Um, 
thankfully, Ermiko had on his computer a video. And in the video, they referred themselves as a group of MFers uh, doing business dealings. Now you'll see the individuals on the far left, that's our buddy Nikita and the check hoodie. Uh, that's Owen Folsing, that's the money pen, the cash out piece. Uh, our buddy is getting in the middle, being a little silly. And on the far right here, it's nice to have a little whiteboard where they're writing each other's monikers down, <clears throat> which helps us <laughs> say exactly who's in the room if we weren't sure already. <laughs> also on that drive of Air Diego, we found some Skype chats. And the timing is very interesting. This is October of 2012. Uh, outside of the 6.5 million user credentials that were made available on Inside Pro, the rest were never made public until years later. And so you see uh, the first name, it's Evgeny Lomovich in Cyrillic, which, <clears throat> fun fact, Lomovich roughly translates, I don't know any Russian speakers, to hacker or breaker. So the Evgeny hacker is kind of fun. Uh, he provides an email address and a password hash that Aramaic provides a list of just what appear to be random numbers. Well, those are LinkedIn IDs. So those are people that he's targeting. And then uh, two minutes later, uh, you're going to come back with those same IDs and a nice format, email address and password hash. So you can see they're targeting specific individuals. So at this point, we realize, okay, again, he has access to this data that's not made public. He's got to be the one. If that weren't enough, the chat continues. Um, and Aramienko tell wishes Nikulin happy birthday. And yes, that was exactly on Nikulin's birthday based on the m line return from Russia. Um, and of course, in true hacker fashion, he's asking what kind of gift he's going to give. He says, well, you're going to turn 25. Nikulin well, was 25 in 2012, so that also helps. Um, so buy a watch. Up to 10000 Now go for 25000 You're 25. It just kind of shows you the mindset of these individuals and the money that they spend. Now, Nikulin was in Russia. Besides the MLAT return, we never got access to any of his devices, but that didn't stop us. Some people think we're dead in the water. Well, we're able to use a web of all his online accounts to show all this circumstantial evidence that after a while compounds so greatly that it couldn't be anybody else. And so the China Bank 01 email account was the one LinkedIn identified. They had a free DNS account within there. To the unique username is Opal One. We use very sophisticated well, Google to find the congregate account using the same username. Now, Google search at the time for Zopical One yielded, I think, 20 or less results. That never happens. Even you can search random terms, you're getting thousands of results. But we knew we were pretty close. That account had the email address from Talco, with, of course, a little link to make there for root. Um, and you know, that root. At this point, we had already requested information from the Russians. We're a little hesitant. We want to pump the brakes a little bit and not ask for too much about a certain individual. So we didn't want them to go approach them. Um, and so we tried to pivot on that. Now, a lot of these guys live and die by their monikers. So this he is trying to big, but Rutalka. So we said, okay, where else does that moniker come up? And lo and behold, there was a Gmail account, Rutalka at Gmail. So we get a search warrant on the account and we see the Congress account used a credit card to pay. It ended at the Russian credit card and it ended at 0405. That same credit card was used in the Rutalka Gmail account to pay for Photostrana, like an online uh, photo sharing site in Russia. We compared the search history before the, between the two accounts, and you'll see a lot of things that are interesting. Obviously, kind of big searches for LinkedIn hashes on 67 was made public a couple of days prior. Uh, searches for Canton or Skya Street. That just happens to be the street that you know, lives on in Russia, um, as well as some other vulnerabilities related topics. Uh, Lutaka, very similar, LinkedIn hack as well. Uh, searches for dentistry, Nikulin had a bad tooth. Um, we we'll found out later, so he was looking for help for that. Um, but he was also looking for a dentist on the same street that he lived in in Moscow. And obviously other search and hack related jokes. Now, this is all great, but we still have just a lot of circumstantial evidence. So what we try to do is, is kind of expand the scope, right? These hackers are pretty good with their OPSEC, their accounts are locked down, they're using uh, encryption to communicate with each other, but spouses, uh, parents, girlfriends, kids, their OPSEC's not nearly as great. And they like to boast the proceeds of all these crimes. And so that's where we started to target next. As you can see here, we have photos of Nicole on the left. Yes, that is a CIA logo on his laptop. Um, classic hacker photo in a warehouse somewhere. Um, and of course, he's on the uh, second story there in bar. And in fake green text, it says, uh, 
you have been helped. So a little bit of a story. But his girl, his ex-wife and girlfriend, and you see in the uh, VK account, the Russian equivalent of Facebook, his girlfriend is showing the Lamborghini that they put to drive around and together. In the Mutalka at Gmail, that was used to create the uh, social media account on VK for this one. He goes by Top Man. Yes, that great hack of the photo. Uh, but he's receiving photos or messages from other individuals. Um, he had the settings set just right. So if he wasn't online, they were sent to his email. So then we could see them. Um, he had a friend saying, I just moved. I'm now on Captain Roskaya Street again. We should meet up. It's great. Um, his brother, uh, Mihail, reaching out and connecting. And then his girlfriend. Now, this is all fun. We know who he is, but he's still in Russia. What the heck are we going to do? Well, thankfully, he no likes to stay in Russia too long. It's cold and miserable in the winter. So he decides to bolt. And he posts that selfie at the Russia Belarus border um, on his Instagram account. Not thinking anything of it. He even had friends comment on the post that said Interpol? He said, Nah, I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> he's not fine. So we have him shortly there, there, the Belarus pole, pole border. So we hurry up, we uh, get an arrest warrant for him, uh, get a red notice, we issue it out to various countries. Uh, on the path, he was heading towards Italy, so we hit all the countries along the way. Um, by the time we were able to catch up, he was in the Czech Republic. They scrambled their fugitive team, they're tracking his cell phone, uh, and they find him at a restaurant having lunch with his girlfriend, which Czechs were kind enough to give us this keepsake and record it. Now, you'll notice a few interesting things as we're barking words at him. That watch he's wearing, it's about a fifty dollars to $60,000 Rolex. And the high tops, they have the S Gold padlock, and those are about $1,000 each as well. Now, the vehicle he drove from Russia to the Czech Republic was a high-end uh, Mercedes SUV. He decided to change the Mercedes logo to a shark. <laughs> so what happens next? He's in the Czech Republic um, in October of 2016. Um, he's trying to fight tooth and nail not to come to the United States. It's a complicated thing. The Russian Federation files a competing extradition packet, trying to just throw a smoke at it to see if they can get him back in country before we can get him. A long battle ensues. He's in custody in Prague for about 18 months um, before uh, things start to move. So in March of 2018, now he's arrested in 2016, so he's there for quite some time. Um, we get word from the Minister of Justice in the Czech Republic that says, hey, if we rule in your favor, we're not saying we are, but if we are, and do rule in your favor, how quickly could you get people here to take him out? Because they didn't want any uh, shenanigans from the Russian side to happen in Prague. So our legat, our FBI agent there in Prague says we can be there as soon as you make that decision. So we scramble individuals, we get to Prague on March 25th, and by the 29th, they do end up ruling in our favor um, and transfer custody to us. These are some fun photos of some people in his transport to uh, the FBI jet that we had on standby. Now, the reason we used the private jet was because um, he had made comments that he would never get on an airplane, some threats of violence, uh, the string beam. So we took that very seriously. And we didn't want to cause any incident in the Czech Republic. He's not as happy now, sitting on a bench prior to his court appearance in San Francisco. Afterwards, uh, the Speaker of the House, Paul Ryan, uh, tweeted, thanks to the Czech government uh, for their assistance in the case. The White House also thanked the Czechs um, for their assistance. And I will say, without the great relationship that we had with uh, the Czech Republic and our uh, agents in country there, none of this would ever happen. We had those established relationships that were built over years and that trust and that led to this positive outcome. The Minister of Justice, shortly after that decision, decided to step down, and he specifically cited this case. He said it was a mental tug of war, he didn't want the country to be torn apart, and so he decided to resign. Once we have people here in custody, the investigation can stop. We're continually looking for new evidence, and we found a nugget in a jail telephone call that he had with his girlfriend, Anna, who was also one of the individuals on that VK account that sent him messages, so it helps kind of confirm all those identities. Um, he was complaining about his attorneys. He would call them and ask, try to ask them questions at all hours of the night. And she said, look, no one work, your attorneys aren't working 24-7. What's your response? I hack websites 24-7. And then corrects his tense that I hacked websites. 
that was great to show the jury when we went to trial in the mindset of some people. After a break because of COVID, uh, he was found guilty on, on all nine counts, a uh, myriad of these different uh, violations, and was sentenced to 88 months uh, in prison. Now, that did take into account the time that he had spent in prison in the Czech Republic, which I'm sure was far worse than custody here in the U.S. Um, and he was just recently released uh, in February. I think he's on his way to being deported uh, back to Russia now. Of course, everyone likes to see the proceeds. We have, there's that shark, uh, Mercedes, his Bentley that he drove, of course, with a $50,000 watch, the classic hacker photo uh, in Red Square with the Lamborghini and his other uh, Porsche. Now, there are some fun OSINT tools available, uh, and I highly recommend a lot of them. Um, this one, it's a website, individuals collect uh, license plate numbers for fancy cars in a row. So I said, well, what the heck? Let's punch in his license plate number and see what happens. There he is. And, and another line. <laughs> can't mistake that helmet head in. It's not. <laughs> Sure. I mean, I think it just goes to them being uh Question. Sure. So the, the question was, why are they using so blase about using um, true IP addresses or IP addresses that don't obfuscate their identity? And I think it just goes down to their mentality, right? They think they're not going to get caught. They're in Russia. They feel um, immunity from prosecution and outside the reach of U.S. law enforcement. And so I think it's just more of audacity. They just don't seem to care. But they have to be lucky every time. I don't have to get lucky again. So that's just sure. So. So uh, just a follow-up question on that. Uh, obviously, we've seen a lot of political changes within the last couple of years. Um, so this used to be very commonplace, this case that you're talking about, and the Russians would you know, do things with impunity. Absolutely. Uh, do you think that that changes because of the changes we've seen? Are some of these high-profile names going abroad now? Or are they staying in Russia? So I think it, it's changed slightly. The cooperation isn't as great as it used to be, because it used to be very good. Um, so we have to deal with that complication. But these individuals still like to travel. Um, even with the current political climate, they don't want to be in Russia. They have all this wealth and money, and whether it's themselves, their spouses, uh, friends, they want to travel. And we'll wait them out. I, I will say one thing that we have seen more of is that some of these individuals are more mindful about where they can and can't that travel, true. right? Like, we know that they talk about where they're safe and where they're not safe. Sometimes they're right about that, and sometimes they're not so right. But we don't really, we don't really want them to know those answers. Did you have a question, too, man? Probably the last one here. Yeah. Okay. I was just wondering what happened to all the proceedings that they got, like all of those cars, did they get taken away or? Uh, unfortunately, all of that was in Russia. We don't have access to that. We never use a U.S. financial institution, um, but he, he's been in custody for a while. I can't imagine he's going to go back and all that will still be there. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Thank you so much for having us. Thank Gentlemen, you. Thank, thank you very you. much.